pay a lot of attention because a lot of this stuff is immediately usable. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I suggest you implement some of the suggestions right after the webinar. Uh, it's going to be highly valuable. Uh, both the suggestions on how to connect with prospects on LinkedIn and a lot of the stuff that Tim Wackel has to do, has to say. Uh, so I've had some fantastic results with Tim Wackel's suggestions. In fact, uh, some of my uh, in a previous webinar we had with him, uh, he was suggesting that we should get in touch with uh, prospects at least seven times and we're doing that in-house right now and I, I'm seeing the results of that. I'm so happy with the results. So Tim, thank you for that tip and I'm hoping, I'm hoping a lot of people are going to write back to us today and say that this is fantastic content from Tim. Okay, so Tim, I'll hand over the floor to you in 10 minutes but before that, uh, let's quickly find out uh, how you can connect to the correct prospects on LinkedIn, okay? And I'll give you a few tips on uh, in a short while. But before that, a lot of people ask me, well, why are you talking about LinkedIn, Clint? Why, why, are, uh, why are salespeople focused on LinkedIn right now? Well, uh, I'm going to tell a short story. I'm going to take you back in, in time. And this is a personal story of eGrabber. And uh, since I've been here at eGrab, I've seen a lot of pieces of this myself. But here's what, here's how we at eGrab fell in love with LinkedIn. So we started off a long time back in 1992. Yeah, we we invented the business card reader and all that those stuff. Well, at that time, the the best way that you got in touch with your prospects, or at least the way which which worked with us, we used the phone book. We used the yellow pages. Put a team together, did hundreds of calls per day. Got few positive responses per day and yes we were pumped at that time but they had, we had to make a lot of touch points to get those get those results so as time went by the trade shows and conferences brought more focused audiences together and we we found our calling over there yeah we still had to talk to a lot of people but uh, at least we had spent lesser time uh, in calling as as time went by this new thing called email came in uh, in 2004, we, we started experimenting with this thing called email, the third party email delivery. So we noticed that when we send out 200 emails, we got one positive response. And that was good, that, that was a great improvement uh, that, that we thought was good. I mean, so uh, previously we'd, we'd spend many days in trade shows, now we could just do it in maybe a few hours. So that was, that was good. And as uh, the email thing matured, as the email industry matured, there were suddenly list vendors who came in and gave us control of what uh, of the demographics that that we needed. Okay, they gave us control of the title, the industry, the type of companies that that uh, we could we could send to, and this was good. That is great. We still got the same results because. You know, contacts went out of date. People, people didn't update the list vendors, and this vendors maybe they had a few million contacts. They had a hard time updating all that stuff. Suddenly, around 2009, 2010, this thing called LinkedIn cropped up. Okay, and since we have experimented with every single form of lead generation that we had access to, we thought we'll try. We'll give this a try. And remember, 2009, 2010, LinkedIn was still a place where you put your resume because you wanted a job. So it wasn't used for sales, it was mainly used for recruiting. Well, it turns out that we were in touch with the recruiting market, we were selling a lot to the recruiting market, and we picked up on this little trend in the recruiting market. Since the recruiters loved it, we thought, hmm, well, can we use this for our own sales? And in 2009, 2010, we started looking up LinkedIn and sending cold emails to prospects that we identified on LinkedIn. Guess what? Immediately, our response rates doubled. And the more we tweaked it, it doubled and it doubled and it doubled again. So with 20 emails, we get one person to say, yes, I'm interested, can I have a look at your software? As time goes by, 2015, right now I can send out eight emails with, with if, and if we target it properly, I know I'm going to get one person who's interested in looking at our tool. So that's why we like LinkedIn. We love LinkedIn because it's very, very effective in getting to the right prospects in time. So that's why you should be on LinkedIn. That's why uh, you should be targeting people on LinkedIn. And the secret to really targeting 
and getting the type of response on LinkedIn is really the advanced search on LinkedIn and if you haven't played with this yet you should because previously you could just search by title or from the list vendors you could search by how big the company was but LinkedIn gives you so many filters that you can use and playing around with these filters over many months we have learned to really focus and send out just touch base with a small group of people and get a huge response back and mind you ladies and gentlemen these are cold emails they've never heard of us before they might have heard of us for the newest they might have just heard of us yesterday okay or maybe through the email so there's so many things I can filter and narrow down and find my prospects with for example uh, five years back I could not find a VP of marketing who was really doing outbound email marketing right I, I get I get a whole list of VP of marketing people but I never know how many people are actually doing email marketing and I'd waste my time following them but right now with LinkedIn I can find people who are doing email marketing right now who are interested who have joined those groups right now who maybe have enough experience in that company in that function and I can reach out to them and those might be the decision makers who have the potential who have the the credit card with them who have the who have the buying capability to buy my tools so LinkedIn is a great source for new qualified prospects okay so that's about LinkedIn but how do you connect better on LinkedIn and here are four tips that that I've learned by talking to uh, many 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 companies who who have tried LinkedIn for the first time or who are getting their sales reps to try LinkedIn and they're going through a few initial problems teething problems so here are the most common things that you could do to get yourself up and running on LinkedIn okay now tip number one LinkedIn is a place for connections so you have to be hyper connected for LinkedIn to work with you okay to link, for LinkedIn to work for you okay now what do I mean by that because if if you have started searching on LinkedIn if you have used the, the search capabilities you might notice that some of your prospects uh, are coming up like that on LinkedIn uh, you see the blue arrows uh, I get something which says LinkedIn member I don't get the name of the person and uh, I can't I can't follow up from here I know this person is VP at NASDAQ but there's nothing much I can do from here except perhaps send a ten dollar in mail and hopefully they'll respond else my ten dollars are gone but how do I see more names names and companies in my results okay this I've seen with a lot of salespeople who are just joined in they are new to the industry um, they don't have many connections so how do you get past this LinkedIn member problem okay uh, here are two ways you can do it okay first you should connect to these people called lions you know uh, short the lion is a short form for LinkedIn open networker and these people have like the really really huge uh, connection basis uh, like the the ladies over there on screen have maybe 4,000 connections but there are people with 25,000 30,000 connections so if you connect to them their whole network of 4,000 25,000 they become your second degree network they're one step ahead of or one step away from you okay so connecting to these lines takes away a lot of those LinkedIn member searches another useful thing that you could do go to LinkedIn groups search for LinkedIn groups and join the biggest groups that you can find okay like on LinkedIn the the jobs group okay, is the biggest group it's got 1.7 million members join there you never know if uh, if somebody who's working for your decision maker is part of the group so then your decision makers is going to be to it's going to be one step away it's very easy so you should join the biggest group just choose the top three like you're looking at the top three groups right now join them right now go become a member and you you will have a huge network that you can tap into that's tip number one a tip number two as you get more and more um, familiar with the LinkedIn search and use more of that uh, you will hit that red box at the bottom LinkedIn will say that you've you have finished your commercial use. You have a limited number of searches, maybe 10, 15. No one really knows, but 
uh, once you do a, quite a few searches on LinkedIn in a month, then you'll be stopped from using the search until you upgrade to the paid version of LinkedIn. Now, the paid version of LinkedIn is good, but if you still like to hang on to your free version, there are ways to get around this problem. Okay, and here are the ways to get around this problem. There is a little tool, and uh, you can. I suggest you note down that URL at the bottom of the screen. That's HTTP bit.ly slash search hyphen LinkedIn. Be careful with the case. So S is in caps, L is in caps. Note that down. Now, this is a very neat search engine that, that uh, one of our friends put together. So you can open that search, and you can type in um, a title or keyword or whatever you'd like. And when you click that search, you get a whole bunch of results of people who you're not even connected with. And these are way outside your network. And you can do this as many times as you like because you're using Google and you're not using LinkedIn. And you can use this to uh, for as many uh, queries as you want in a month. And you, you can find people who you would not find on the LinkedIn search. Very useful, handy little tool. Uh, I use this all the time for my lead generation. So very, very useful. Tip number three is how a few other ways to get around the commercial search limit and maybe even see a different set of results that you never saw before. LinkedIn's got an alumni search and you can see the link at the bottom of the screen. I'll take a while to note that down. That's linkedin.com slash edu slash alumni. Go over there and you, you'll find a blue button on the screen where you can change the university. Now, why university? Well, because if you know, if you know someone from your university, perhaps you'd be able to connect with them better. And uh, the nice thing is, um, these are completely out of my network. I, I have no idea who they are. And, the, and I get a breakdown by what function they are, by what specialization they are in. So it's, it's a really nice thing to, uh, to get connected to new prospects on LinkedIn. Okay, That's the alumni search. Another way is uh, you can use, oops, there's a, a mistake at the bottom of the screen. It's not the alumni search. This thing is the, the skill search. Okay, so you can use LinkedIn.com slash edu slash fos, and I can search here by by my field of study. That's what they call it. Right now, I can search by marketing, or I can search by B2B sales, or I can search by financial uh, prospecting. I can search by a lot of keywords over here and get a list of the people who I'm not connected to. Very, very useful if you hit the commercial search limit. Okay, and last tip, uh, if you have uh, if you send a lot of connection requests on LinkedIn and you're waiting for people to respond, um, yeah, well, uh, if you have sent a fantastic offer and uh, in, in your email and people are still not responding, well, maybe they're busy. Maybe they're not checking their LinkedIn. Okay. Now, uh, we we face this problem too because uh, what we found is people have linked a lot of their profiles to their personal email addresses, so your connection, your email is reaching the personal mailbox. And it's going there, uh, if it's Gmail, it's going there right on the updates tab and it's getting mixed up with all the offers and all the other stuff that's coming in. They're not seeing your message. So I had this problem with my salespeople and so what we did is we started sending a uh, personal connection request plus we started sending them an email to their business email box too. Okay, and this uh, this double our response rates very useful. So send that connection request, but don't forget to send an email to the business inbox. Uh, you can decide whether to do it on the same day or maybe wait wait a couple of days and send that. But do send an email to the business email box. Okay, and those are the four tips uh, what you can use. Um, the and if you're wondering by the way, if you uh, I have uh, somebody's the uh, LinkedIn profile. I don't have the email address. No problem. Uh, we invented a tool called the Email Prospector. Uh, you can take anybody's name and company, type it into the Email Prospector, and this software will figure out what that person's email address is. Very handy little tool. I use it for my own sales. Uh, and there's going to be an offer on this towards the end for everybody who's here on the webinar. Um, so that's that's there. I could use it on a list of of LinkedIn search results as well. Anybody, type in a name and company, and this thing can find you the business email address that you can use to connect with. Now, hope those have been helpful to you. Now, use these tips to find your prospects on LinkedIn. And when you find your prospects on LinkedIn, 
use some of the tips that Tim Walker is going to tell you. Uh, and Tim's really going to shake uh, your belief on how you should engage prospects. So uh, Tim, uh, the floor is yours right now. Well, thank you, and thanks for all that great information, Clinton. Let's go ahead and give me control, and let's see if, uh, can everybody see my screen okay? Clinton, are you able to see my screen all right? Yes, I can. Super, 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 super. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Stop Pitching, Start Solving, helping customers discover what they really want. My name is Tim Walkle, and the question we've got to be asking ourselves is why. Why are we here today? Well, I think it's odd that companies all over the world spend millions of dollars teaching their salespeople what to say, but they spend almost nothing teaching them what to ask. And here's the deal. The questions you ask and how you ask them are going to increase your success faster than anything you're ever going to say. Now, you probably already have a number of questions that you like to ask customers during a sales conversation. Maybe you'll recognize a few of these. Uh, do you have a budget? Uh, who's involved in making a decision? You want to save money, don't you? And then my all-time favorite, what keeps you up at night? See, here's the deal. Asking these questions may help you as a salesperson. The customers hear these exact same questions from just about every other rep. And after a while, your customer, quite frankly, gets bored hearing these same mind-numbing questions over and over and over again. You can usually tell when you get caught in a slump of asking bad questions because more often than not, the conversation ends with the customer saying, hmm, why don't you leave me some information and I'll get back to you. Still not convinced? Then let's just take a real simple pop quiz. I'd love to have you go to the chat box right now and chat in what are the three best questions everybody in your organization should be asking today. What are the three best questions everybody inside your organization should be asking customers today? Go ahead. Write them down. I'll wait. Now, I'm guessing this exercise is probably a little bit harder than most of you would care to admit. As a matter of fact, here's what's fascinating. A recent survey by the Sales Development Institute discovered that 87% of salespeople, 87% of salespeople know it's really important that you be able to ask thought-provoking questions. So 9 out of 10, yet only 27% display the ability to do this when talking to a client. So 9 out of 10, 87%, basically 9 out of 10 say, man, this is important. Yet only 27%, which is fundamentally 3 out of 10, say, yeah, I can do this. And that's going to be the focus of our program today. So a couple of quick tips before we get into the content, some keys to success. Uh, number one, take great notes. Right? The blank piece of paper you have in front of you is worth just a few pennies. But if you take a piece of paper and you fill it with notes and ideas and insights, that becomes a truly valuable resource you can learn from time and time again. You can get a copy of these slides. You're just simply going to have to send me an email. And we'll have this information at the end of the webinar, but you'll just send an email to tim at timwalkle.com, and you'll just say, send slides in the subject line, and I'll get you a package of these slides. Because the goal today is really just to find some ideas to help you get 1% better. I would love to tell all you guys that if you follow all my ideas, you'll double your business overnight, but I would be lying to you. Sales is a science, and we have to continually practice and refine that science until we get better. So look for those ideas that are going to help you get 1% better. You're going to confirm a lot of what you already know, and that's good. Uh, I'm not going to give you ideas that are going to be like, wow, that is so far out there, so wild, I never thought about it before. I'm just going to go back and really reinforce the fundamentals and some basics, but I'm going to give you a different spin and a different slant. Because ultimately, people that are really, really successful have these three traits. The first trait is you got to have desire. So you've got to have desire uh, to be better at asking questions. You've got to have desire to be better at not pitching. But you also have to have a plan. In other words, what's your design for getting better at this thing called probing and then ultimately, you've got to have the discipline to see it through. Because when you try something new, when you uh, try to get better in a particular area, you're going to stumble. You're going to fall. You're not going to have perfection right away. That's OK. Be willing to get up and do it again. So with that, let's get started. Uh, principle number one, the first idea I want to leave you guys with is that prescription before diagnosis is malpractice. Always has been, always will be. Uh, here's some quick examples that I put together that I'm hoping you might enjoy and maybe you might even recognize. Uh, boy, I'd like some time on your calendar to talk about myself, my company, and my products. How often do we see that happening? Uh, even though you get piles and piles of unsolicited email every day, I wanted to call to see if you read the stuff that I sent you. 
or maybe my all-time favorite. I'm eager to tell you everything I know about my great products, and we probably won't even discuss what you're really interested in. There's a good chance I'm going to talk for a long time, so get ready to get bored out of your mind. So, you know, we laugh at these, but it's, sometimes it's a chuckle of familiarity. So, so why is it that we, and myself included, why do we sometimes pitch prematurely? Well, the first reason would be this. Man, we understand our stuff. Uh, and uh, we want to talk about our stuff. I mean, I'd love to talk about our stuff because that's the fun thing. So the number one reason is we understand ourselves. And the number two reason I think people pitch prematurely is there's this countless hours of sales training. You know, a lot of clients that I'd like to do business with uh, won't do business with me. And the reason they won't do business with me is they tell me that they already have a sales training program in place. And I go, great, because I just want to make sure that you don't just turn your reps loose. Because turning your reps loose is not good for you, it's not good for your company, and it's not good for your reps. So when I ask them about their sales training program, you know what it ends up being? They send me a copy of the curriculum. It's not really sales training, folks. It's product training. If your company, if your employer, if your boss is sending you product training and telling you it's sales training, he's committing a sin. Because if all you ever go through is product training, if all they ever talk to you about is product, then what are you going to talk about when you're in front of the customer? You're going to talk about product. So we have to have product training. What we sell is important, but how we sell is critical. But the number one reason I think people really stumble in this area is because we haven't prepared for anything else. So ask yourself this question. How much time do you spend uh, in pre-call planning? How much time do you spend pre-call planning? And the answer typically is little or not enough. My follow-up question would be this. The time that you do spend in pre-call planning, what percentage of that pre-call planning time is spent thinking about what am I going to say versus what percentage of that time is spent thinking about what am I going to ask? So here's what I realize is most guys and gals don't do enough pre-call planning. And the pre-call planning that is happening, way too much of the focus on, hey, this is what I need to say. So what happens when we pitch prematurely? The prospect doesn't engage. Forget prospects. Uh, people in general. Have you ever been in a social situation and you meet somebody relatively new? And they just go on and on and on and on about them and their life and their family and their kids and their troubles and their concerns. It's socially awkward. And so we don't gravitate towards people who talk all the time. What else happens when we pitch prematurely? You're going to have to generically position your product. All right, if somebody says, hey, Tim, I want, my, I want my guys to go through presentation training. Oh, yeah, I can do presentation training. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm pitching prematurely. Somebody says, hey, Tim, uh, I want my guys to go through presentation training. My first question would be, well, well why? Why do you want them to go through presentation? What would presentation look like? What would presentation training look like for you? How will you know whether or not this presentation training is going to be successful? I want to understand where they're coming from. And the only way I'm going to be able to do that is by asking great questions. Often you're going to prematurely focus on the obvious. And ultimately, salespeople that pitch prematurely, myself included, we miss opportunities. Because we take the first need, we take the first concern, we take the first pain point, and that's what we jump all over versus spending time really, really understanding what the total landscape looks like. You know, if I, if I went to my doctor uh, because my ankle hurt, he could treat the ankle, but he could also maybe say, well, gee, let's, let's look at the whole leg. Maybe we ought to do x-rays. Maybe it's your diet, Tim. Maybe it's your exercise. Maybe it's how you sleep at night, right? There may be a lot of things contributing to the ankle pain, but if my doctor doesn't do a good job of asking all those questions, he's going to focus on one thing. And you would never go to a doctor. If you went to a doctor and said, man, I just... I just, uh, I, I don't feel good, and he, and he gave you a prescription right away. You'd feel a little nervous. You'd be like, well, aren't you going to ask me about why I don't feel good and how long I've not been feeling good? Of course you would. So that leads me immediately into my next principle, right? If I don't want you to pitch, pitch prematurely, then please ask smart questions, because when you ask smart questions, they're going to think you are smart. But if you ask dumb questions, right? So pop quiz. Hey, if I could save you some money, would you be interested in moving forward? So what do you guys think? Smart question, dumb question. Go ahead and go to your chat box. Tell me, do you think this is a smart question or dumb question? That's right. It's a dumb question. So why do we have troubles asking these great questions? Well, e e e you know, we don't want to look uncertain. And it's okay to look uncertain. A little bit of humility goes a long way. Sometimes reps get so wrapped up and, and they think they only have a little bit of time that they don't spend the time asking questions. And there's always enough time. You know, in my business, every once in a while, somebody will say, look, you got 10 minutes, pitch me. And I refuse to do that. If you think I'm going to pitch you in 10 minutes, then let's just not waste your time. And let's not waste my time. 
Now, if you truly only have 10 minutes, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make a deal with you. You give me five minutes to ask you some very, very specific, insightful questions, and then I'll spend the second five minutes really kind of helping you understand how my product and services align with your needs. But if you want me just to pitch, I'm not going to do that because it's just generic spew. Uh, oftentimes we hear, well, Tim, you don't understand asking isn't selling, and I can't argue with that. If you're going to sell, you must tell. The experience is that most people don't like being sold to. I know I don't like being sold to, but I love to buy. If I walk into an electronics store and I want to buy a new TV and somebody comes up and starts pitching me features, my eyes roll over. Screen size, resolutions, refresh rates, I don't care. What I want is somebody come in and say, hey, help me understand where are you going to use this TV? How are you going to use this TV? What's the lighting look like in that room? What's important to you when purchasing a TV? Right? That guy's going to help me make a better buying decision. That's the kind of rep I want to be around. But the number one reason we don't ask very good questions is because we're really not working on it. It's a skill we're not training on. So I'm often asking if sales reps, sales organizations, what are the thought-provoking questions you think everybody should be asking? And more often than not, I get a lot of blank stares, or the questions I get aren't very good questions. So let me share with you today just four simple examples of great questions that I've been using. Um, but here's the disclaimer, I can't guarantee they're going to work for you. I can guarantee they're going to work. I just can't guarantee they're going to work for you. Check this one out. I sell blank, and you know what? There's a ton of options out there. How in the world is somebody in a position like you? How do you choose? So why does this work? Well, I sell blank, and there's a ton of options out there. Right away, that's very low pressure. That doesn't sound salesy at all. When I engage with a client, I say, gosh, here's the deal, man. I do sales training, and there's a ton of options out there. That really sounds um, disarming, right, because I'm not really pushing. And so... I love starting with that. I love starting with a gentler, uh, non-abrasive approach. So I start with, hey, man, I sell blank. There's a ton of options out there. And then I circle back and I say, how in the world? How in the world is somebody positioned like yours? Okay, what does that sound like? That sounds like a certain amount of respect. Uh, and I don't care if it's the secretary or the CEO or somebody in between. People want to feel important. I woke up this morning and I didn't think to myself, well, I hope I run into a bunch of people that make me feel like an idiot. I, you know, you wake up and you go, man, I hope the people around me today, the people I'm going to run into today, the people I'm going to talk to on the phone today, I, I, you know, I hope I get treated well. And so when you ask somebody, man, how in the world is somebody positioned like yours, how do you choose? And the, and the reason I ask choose, it's a very simple word, but most salespeople are stuck on the word decide. And, and here's what I'll tell you is when I ask this question, two things happen. And it's really the sign of asking great questions. Two things happen. Number one, there's pause. The reason there's pause is because your customer is trying to think how to respond to the question. Right? When you ask a question they've heard over and over again, they respond right away. If I ask you what day were you born on, you, you're going to answer because you've been asked that question hundreds of times. But if I would ask you, gee, would you mind sharing with me the exact date and time your existence on this planet began, you'd be like, huh. Right? So I'm asking it in a different way. So it causes them to pause. That's the first thing that happens. And the second thing that happens is the first words out of their mouth are, wow, that's a good question. Here's another example. You know, there's always risk and uncertainties with projects like this, with changes like this, with training programs like this, with software products like this. Why in the world wouldn't you just leave things alone? Now, I know that seems to be a bit contrarian, but I find it to be a fascinating way to discover just how interested your customer is. Because if they don't have a very good message to tell here, maybe there's not as much motivation as you think there is. Here's another example. Some clients have a tough time calculating a reasonable number for a project like this. Tell me a little bit about how you guys came up with your budget. So here's the deal, right? When I tell people, man, sometimes clients really have a hard time coming up with a reasonable number for sales training like this. I'm giving my client permission to say, uh, oh, yeah, you know, we are having a hard time. So I want them to know it's okay that they're having a hard time. Then I say, tell me a little bit about how you guys came up with your budget. I'm, I'm not asking what their budget is because when you ask people what their budget is, it makes them feel uncomfortable. I don't, I, when, I'm, when I'm the buyer, I don't want to tell somebody what their, my budget is. But when you ask somebody, hey, tell me how you came up with your budget, then you understand how they came up with it. You're probably going to learn who was involved in coming up with it. And even more importantly, more often than not, they're going to share exactly what the budget is. Because you're not asking for the budget, you're asking for the story behind the budget. And my fourth and final example for you guys this morning is, man, at the end of the day, what's going to be the biggest difference between the one rep, the one firm, the one company that's going to win your business and the three others that come in second place? My point to you is this. If I don't sit down and plan and prepare these questions in advance, I'm not going to ask questions like this. 
right? Because these are, are more eloquent, uh, more intellectual than I than I would normally operate at, right? When I'm with my friends, you, you know, your language is very very comfortable, very informal. But when you're trying to engage with a with a new prospect, or you're trying to engage with an existing customer, you got to make sure that you know what you're saying and why you're saying it, how you're saying it. Communication is the key. So I want to make sure I'm thinking these questions through. My tip for you is I want you to be curious. Just be more curious. I love being around brand new salespeople because you know what? They ask a ton of questions because they're petrified, right? But the more seasoned salespeople see all myself, uh, sometimes we're like, yeah, I've heard this a million times before. I don't need to ask questions, right? It's really easy when somebody says, hey, Tim, would you come do presentation skills training for us? It's really easy for me to say, yeah, I can help you versus really being in the moment and being curious. So I guess what I'm suggesting is this. I showed you four questions out of my library. If you didn't like those four, well, then you could pick one of these. And if you don't like those, then you can pick one of these. And if you don't like those, then you can pick one of these. And if you don't like those, then you can pick one of these. I, I, I think I've made my point, is that if you're not planning and pairing your questions in advance, um, you're not performing at, at the highest levels that you could perform. This is not hard stuff. It's just simply discipline. Over the years, I try questions. They work well. I put them in my library. They don't work well. I try to modify them. Then I put them in my library. If I modify them, they still don't work well. I get rid of them, and I go on to something different. The second tip I'll give you is this, is be careful that you don't make too many assumptions, because assumption can be the mother of all sales mistakes. You know, I like to share with audiences all the time. My wife and I are proud parents of two great kids. Our daughter is, uh, is married and living over in the Fort Worth area. She teaches special needs kids. She's just got a big heart. She's just a fantastic kiddo. And, uh, and our son is getting ready to graduate from the uh, University of Alabama here in just a couple of weeks. But anyway, I share that story because when our daughter was little, when Maggie was a little girl, uh, she absolutely idolized the TV character Barney. And so her mom and I painted her room in a Barney theme, decorated the whole room in a Barney theme. So what words would you use to describe that, that room? Go ahead, go up to your chat panel, shoot me what words would you use to describe that room. Go ahead, decorated her room in a Barney theme. What did it look like? So it appears, though, most of you think the room was purple and full of dinosaurs. Well, check it out. Assumption's the mother of all mistakes. So I told you her room was decorated in a Barney theme, and most of you went here. And I get that. That would be like the most logical place to go. But I told you this. I said, we decorate, you know, she idolized the TV character Barney. That's what I told you, TV character Barney. And you immediately went to Barney the dinosaur. Is there not, you know, Barney Rubble or Barney Fife? And I get it. You know, if my daughter's room was decorated in a Barney Fife theme, um, you'd think that that was kind of like she was a freak. <laughs> you'd be right. But I use this just to demonstrate a point. Here's the point, folks. These words, much like Barney, have multiple meanings. Yet these words are used each and every day in sales conversations. And, and it amazes me. You know, a customer says, send me a proposal, and the rep goes, okay, I can do that. Whoa, 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 send me a proposal. Why do you want me to send you a proposal? What needs to be in a, pro a proposal? What makes one proposal stand out from all the others? Uh, how long will it take you to get back to me if I send you a proposal? Right, we should be asking questions, asking questions. Somebody says, it's been approved. What does that mean? As far as I'm concerned, it's, it's, it's trash until it's cash. So make sure that you're paying attention, make sure that you're in the moment, and make sure that you're uh, asking questions and asking intelligent questions. The other thing I'll tell you to do, too, is I want you to always try to set the tone. And what I mean by that is when we teach, when we teach sales organizations how to ask better questions, uh, a lot of times we're talking about context, putting some context behind your question. And, and here's really what I'm, what I'm talking about is that um, if you just fire out question and after question, it feels like an interrogation. Uh, tell me about your budget. Tell me about your decision-making process. It's like, whoa, 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 too many questions. And so when we talk about context, what context means is this, is I want you to kind of set the tone. So here's, here's a great way to set context at the beginning of an initial sales meeting. You know what? I do business with a lot of companies, and I'm proud of my work. But that doesn't mean I'm going to be right for you. Okay, high pressure or low pressure? That's low pressure. Before I launch, at the, at the end of the day, I need to learn more about your exact situation before you and I working together can figure out whether or not this is a good fit. So before I launch into how great my existing customers think I am, would it be okay if I just asked you a few key questions? Right? You start your next client conversation, new client conversation like that, and they'll melt in your hands. 
Because what if you told them, you said, look, I do business with a lot of companies, and I'm really proud of my work, that doesn't mean I'm going to be right for you. Low pressure. Then you invite, you say, look, at the end of the day, you and I, we need to learn more about our exact situation here before we can determine whether or not this is a good fit. All right, sounds fair. And then you wrap up by saying, look, before I launch into how great my existing customers think I am, can I ask you just a few key questions? And then you just got to make sure that the next words out of your mouth are key questions and not some uh, senseless sales dribble. Okay, folks, we're in the home stretch here. The third and final principle I want to share with you today is make sure that you don't get hooked to hopium. Make sure that you kick your hopium habit. So a lot of you might be wondering, what in the world is he talking about? Let me give you an example. If I'm your sales manager and I hear you ask a question like this, we're going to have a little coaching moment. I think this is one of the worst questions you can ask a customer. Gee, would you like me to go ahead and put together a proposal? Let me share why. Two different sales reps call on me. The first sales rep is a rock star. Uh, they're on time. They've done their homework. They've done proper planning and preparation. Uh, they've got great experience in the industry. I like their company. They come in. They ask me great questions. They do a great job managing our time together. I'm treated with respect. I'm interested. And if that first sales rep says, would you like me to go ahead and put together a proposal, my answer is going to be yes. Second sales rep makes a call on me. They're not prepared. They didn't spend much time planning. They really don't ask me any questions. They just go on and on and on. They're wasting my time. And quite frankly, I don't think they get me or my industry. And I really don't think I want to do anything with their company at all. And now I'm looking for an excuse to get out of the conversation. And if that second sales rep, the sales rep I don't like, says, would you like me to go and put together a proposal, I, like most of you, are going to say yes. And the reason we're going to do this is because it's the path of least resistance. It's the best way for me to tell that sales rep, I don't like you, without having to say, I don't like you. I'm just going to take this question, and I'm going to say, yeah, because I know once I agree to a proposal, then we're on to the next stage, and I can completely disengage. So what am I talking about that's different? Instead of, gee, would you like me to go ahead and put together a proposal, we ask questions like this. Hey, I sense that putting together a proposal still is a little bit premature. What are your thoughts? So check it out. Let's go back to the earlier example. If the rock star sales rep, the sales rep I really want to do business with, says, hey, Tim, I sense that putting together a proposal is still premature. What are your thoughts? I'm going to be like, no, 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 it's not premature. Let's do this, man. Send me a proposal. In other words, I'm actually arguing with the sales rep, trying to get them to take me to the next step of the selling cycle. That's pretty powerful. When was the last time you had a customer argue with you on getting to the next step? So that rep knows for sure that I'm ready to move forward. Let's use this example with the second sales rep, the sales rep that I don't want to do business with. If that second sales rep said, hey, Tim, I sense that putting together a proposal is still a little bit premature. What are your thoughts? I'd be like, you know what? You're right. It's still a little premature. Let me, let me just think on it, and if I'm interested, I'll get back to you. So when you take the hopium out of the question, you make it easier for the customer to tell you the truth. You make it easier for the customer to tell you no. Here's another example. Are we still on track to get the agreement signed? You know, you've been calling on this customer for a period of time, and you've, you've treated them with respect, and you've been very professional, and they like you, and you like them. Nobody wants to deliver bad news. So when you're like, hey, we still on track, you're, you know, you, you don't, hey, yeah. if somebody asked me that, I'd be like, oh, man, I, I got some bad news. I don't want to deliver bad news. So if the rep came to me with the bad news and says, hey, here's the bad news, I think we're not going to get the signed agreement. Can you help me understand what I should be doing differently? Well, I got one of two choices. Either I'm going to go back and say, no, 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 you are going to get the agreement, so I'm going to argue for the positive, which is great, or I'll come back and I'll say, yeah, you're right. See, it's a lot easier for me to tell a rep, yeah, you're right, than it is for me to say, I'm sorry, we're not going to do business with you. You're just lowering the barrier of resistance, and that's what I want you to do. And probably the simplest example of all, you know, we've all been taught to ask, hey, is this a good time to talk? My challenge is I call somebody and they're not expecting my call. I say, is this a good time to talk? And just out of, just out of politeness, more often than not, they go, uh, sure. And, and right away I know, okay, this was not a good time. They're just trying to be polite. And, and so I, I want people to be completely honest with me. So instead of asking, is this a good time, I always assume the negative. Hey, Clinton, I know you weren't expecting my call today. Is this a bad time to talk? And here's my experience. When I ask, is this a bad time to talk, more often than not, they're going to say, yeah, it is. And I go, great, get out your calendar, and let's find a good time for you and a good time for me, and I'll call you back then. So don't always go fishing for good news. Don't always hope for the best. I, I wish you nothing but the best, 
but you're foolish to always believe you're going to get the best. So every once in a while, if you can't get a yes, be willing to go for a no. So as we get ready to take some questions, here's some things, guys. Look, if you've got a hopium habit, everything you say and do means that you're looking for a positive response. Everything you say and do is biased by what you hope to hear. Right? If, if I asked you right now, hey, put, put inside the chat box how much you like today's program, you're going to feel almost manipulated to say something nice. First, if I said, hey, guys, I really feel like I missed the mark. Tell me what I should, should have been doing differently today. You'd come back and say, hey, you talked too fast. Hey, this wasn't the content I thought it was going to be. Hey, I thought everybody was going to get a $100 bill. Right? You'd be more open to giving me honest feedback because I didn't go high. I went low. Uh, if you've got a hopium habit, it makes it really difficult for other people to share bad news. And ultimately, reps that have a hopium habit, you've got a lot of deals in your pipeline that shouldn't be in your pipeline. I'm just going to respect you enough to be honest with you that you've got some bad dog food in your pipeline, and it shouldn't be there. You should be flushing through that stuff, and you should be focusing on the real opportunities. So as I wrap this stuff up, guys, just a couple quick questions. You know, If you're serious about having the best career possible, especially in sales, what would you start doing differently tomorrow? And I got a couple things I want you to consider. And I've I've partnered with Clinton, and 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 this is just great that the timing on this is perfect. You know, these are the kinds of clients that I do a lot of sales training programs for. You probably recognize maybe a few of those brands. Well, we've got something kind of special going on. If if you're on the West Coast, um, I'm actually hosting a sales academy out there on May seventh. We're going to spend the full day together. There's over 32 different sales lessons that I'll be teaching. Who's it designed for? For inside or outside reps? What industry? It doesn't matter. If the information I presented to you today resonates, that you're a value-based sales rep, that you want to be consultative, that you want to ask better questions, you want to create better uh, value propositions, you want to make more compelling presentations, if that's kind of what you want to do, then join us in the Santa Clara Convention Center. It's May 7th. If you register now, I actually, if you register in the next couple days here, you can save 80 bucks. And I got a bit.ly for you. It's bit.ly uh, forward slash San Fran Invite. San Fran Invite. We'd love to have you join us. If that doesn't make sense, you know, we've got a whole bunch of training on demand products, which means you can go to my website. And if you want, you know, to learn about, you know, anatomy of a lousy pitch, or uh, you, you had me at a Lowe's about how to create better voicemail messages when prospects go silent, we have all sorts of programs like this that you can purchase and download. And or clients come to me all the time and say, hey, I really just want something customized. I can't get to the West Coast, and I can't bring my whole sales team together. Can you put together a customized webinar for me? The answer is yeah. You, know, you want the same webinar, but you want it just for your sales team. You want it to be interactive so guys aren't muted, and we go back and forth and do exercises. You bet. I'd be more than happy to help you out. You know, you're know, you going to get my contact information, guys. All you got to do is let me know that you're interested, and we'll schedule a call. And with that, let me, uh, let me turn it back over to you, Clinton. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And uh, there's a the bit.ly link which is pasted in your GoToWebinar chat box. So if you want to register for Tim's, uh, Tim's, uh, uh, Tim's uh, web, uh, Tim, sorry, workshop, <laughs> then you go ahead, click that link, and and take that offer right now. By the way, um, in case you want Tim to call you back right now, go ahead and leave your phone number on the GoToMeeting on the GoToWebinar chat, and after this webinar, Tim will get in touch with you. I'll also be sharing Tim's contact information uh, in a short while from now. Before that, a couple of people asked me to show off the email prospector tool because a few of, a few of them are interested. So let me give you a quick 30-second demo. And if you can see my screen right now, you'll be looking at the email prospector tool. So it's a very simple tool. You, you type in a name and company and get an email address. So here's how I use it on a daily basis. Uh, I go to my LinkedIn and uh, whoever I like, and here are some search results of CEOs in, in the area that I that I prospect for. All I do is highlight them, click a button, and add them to the email prospector. And very quickly, the email prospector goes out and figures out the email address. Now, this is a neat piece of software because it doesn't refer to any database, but what it's doing is it's uh, it's actually looking at the internet and seeing if there's any trace of the email address of this person on the internet. And if it does, it gives that to you. Or if not, it might talk to the, the company's web server and, and try to figure out the email address. So it's very easy. All, the, all you need to do is highlight, click on a button, and add it to the software. And it goes ahead and finds email addresses for you. Okay. Uh, that said, uh, on this webinar, 
uh, this this tool, this email prospector tool, it you, we launched it uh, specifically for the sales market this month. So it's usually a 595 uh, annual subscription. There's no there's no cap on number of email addresses you can you can process using this. Um, it's good for 5,000, 6,000 email addresses a year if you need. So all this uh, those email addresses you can get uh, right now if for a 495 dollar value. Okay, uh, and if you like it, you can call us in the next 48 hours, and uh, we'll honor that request. But if you really like uh, the tool and you want to give it a go uh, uh, in the next three hours, uh, there is a special offer which is available uh, only for the next three hours, just because this is a launch month, launch for sales salespeople. So in the next three hours, if you like to avail of a $200 discount on the tool on this email finding tool. Okay. Uh, leave your phone number on the go to meeting chat. Uh, leave your phone number and put Clinton beside it. Uh, if you leave your phone number, put Tim beside it. Tim will give you a call for his sales uh, sales workshop. And if you leave your phone number and put Clinton next to it, then you can get the special offer three ninety five. Uh, and this three ninety five offer, this two hundred dollars off, is available only on the phone. It's not available on the on the website, and it's only through this webinar. So. And those are the offers we have for you, right? Uh, in case you need a little bit more information, in case you want a demo uh, of the software, you write an email to rich at egrabber.com and he'll be happy to set uh, a demo up for you, for your team, for this email prospector tool. Write to rich at the rate egrabber.com. For more information on Tim, uh, that's Tim's contact information, tim at timwalkle.com, and that's his phone number. Uh, if you like to call him, or if you want him to call you back after the webinar, leave your phone number and the word Tim next to it, and he will call you back. Uh, that said, uh, Rich, I believe we have about five minutes for questions. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions, type them into GoToMeeting chat box now, and we will take them. Rich, the floor is yours for questions. All right, Grace. Uh, great. Now, thanks um, talking to you. Um, you know, thanks for uh, bringing all this stuff up. Tim, a special thanks to you. Uh, it was such great information. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and so have a lot of other people. They have left lots of comments um, about the stuff that you spoke about. Uh, we do not have any specific questions at this point of time for you, Tim. The only question and the most primary question that I hear from people on the chat is, Tim, would you please send me the presentation slides? You bet. I'd love to do it, folks. Here's how you get the copy of the slides. Just send an email to Tim, T-I-M, at Tim Walkle. That's T-I-M-W-A-C-K-E-L. Tim at TimWalkle.com. And simply just put in the subject line, Slides, and we've got an autoresponder set up, and we'll get those slides right back out to you today. Fantastic. Precisely, I'd, you know, I'd say what I've people wanted to hear um, in here. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, Clinton, here's a question for you. Hey, uh, this is a question from Van. Van asks, how is eGrabber different than me doing an internet search? Yeah, you can do an internet search, but if you need about 20 to 30 prospects email addresses per day, then you know you have, you have to do your demos. You have to contact them. You have to prospect them. Send them messages. Do all the other sales activities that you want to do. So you, if you really want to save the time, if you want to gain back the time and use it effectively for 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 more value added tasks, then this tool is good for you. Because uh, I've noticed with uh, with my own sales team and with customers, it sometimes takes you about five to fifteen minutes to find an email address. And if you're doing it for twenty to thirty prospects per day. That's a lot of time. Uh, with this tool, this thing does it in seconds, so you can just type a name and company. It's like a very quick email search box, okay? Think of it like that. Uh, so you type in a name company, hit something, uh, and you get an email address out very quickly in a few seconds time. So that's the, the benefit of this. Besides, uh, as a human being, uh, there are only a few searches that you can run at a time, that you can run, and what we have done is the, there are very advanced search queries out there, search techniques, email search techniques out there. There's email verification. That there's a lot of things that a human being cannot do, okay? But the software can. So we have built all that in this, into the software. So in a few seconds, it does a lot of work and gets you a lot of email addresses. Uh, I can challenge you. Uh, go. Uh, there's a trial edition. Uh, uh, 
right to rich at egrabber.com, that's R-I-C-H at egrabber.com, and he'll point you to a trial edition of the software. You can uh, try it out, uh, do a speed test, manual versus the tool, and, you, you, and you'll see the tool's going to win. Uh, if your tool's going to win, okay, basically, uh, if you're trying to find email addresses. So give that a try, okay? Rich? Great. Thanks, Clinton. Here's a follow-up question for you from Glenn. Okay. Um, is the cost per person for this product or on a single license? Yes, this is uh, for one single license. So uh, if you're trying to get email addresses, if you're trying to buy email addresses from anybody, uh, any list vendor, I can guarantee you that those email addresses cost anything like a dollar plus okay and with this thing it's really really cheap I mean if you're using 5,000 email addresses a year uh, 395 if you take the offer it's, it's really less than a few cents per email address and besides uh, this the nice thing about this tool is uh, it doesn't refer to any database so in case somebody joined the company yesterday or in case you're trying to contact uh, somebody who's not a decision maker and make your way through the, the, the or maybe trying to contact the secretary who might be a more important person to get into the decision makers calendar so no, none of those people have the email addresses uh, listed out anywhere and this tool can find their email addresses. So you can find email addresses of people who are not listed anywhere else. It's a very, very powerful tool. Uh, so that is, uh, I hope that answers the question over there. Rich? Yeah, sure, Don't I think it does. Sorry. So, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, the question was, is it, uh, what's the cost? Yes, it's, uh, it's definitely worth its value uh, for one license. So yes, that's, uh, that's the cost for one license. All right, great. Um, Tim, here's a question for you from Dogen. Dogen asks, in the lead generation phase of the sales cycle, do you have any suggestions or best practice for asking questions? Well, I think uh, early on, here's how I look at it, is early on, if you're in lead generation, you have to give them a compelling reason um, to, even, to even engage with you. So when I'm coaching, what does that initial conversation look like? Uh, originally, there has to be value proposition. Right, and value proposition typically consists of three things. What's the issue? What's your recommended action? What kind of impact can somebody expect? So, you know, you can't lead with, hey, I'm here because I want to sell you something. It's, hey, listen, here's the deal. I specialize in working with executives like you who are forced with this and are hoping to accomplish this, and we've worked with other kinds of companies to achieve these kinds of results. Would you mind if I asked you a question? And then you ask a question that brings the attention right back uh, to what you want to talk about. So let me back up again and do that. I got to have a value proposition because I got to give them a reason to listen. If somebody calls me and I don't know them, they go, "Hey, I want to ask you a question." Be like, I'm, "I don't even know who you are." But if they if they called me and said, "Hey, Tim, I specialize in working with sales trainers just like you, who are struggling to get more prospects, and we've got this proven software that'll help you do it," would you mind if I ask you a question? I'd probably go, "Okay." And then you ask that big mind-numbing question. Like one of the questions I sometimes ask sales executives is, I lead with two. I go, "Hey, how much did you spend on sales training last year?" And then my second question is, well, how much do you wish you'd have spent on sales training last year? And that just gets our conversation going. Another question I'll ask sales executives is, what would it be? What would it be? What would your world look like if every rep in your organization performed just like your best rep? Is that something you'd be interested in learning more about? So we got to have value proposition, and then we lead right into a thought-provoking question. All right. I hope that answered uh, the question for Dogen. Um, uh, Clinton, here's a follow-up question from you um, on the program from Paul. Paul asks, are there updates that will come with the purchase of the eGrabber program? Yes, uh, there are free upgrades that come uh, with the purchase of the eGrabber program. So this is a, a yearly subscription program. So during the year, we're subscribed. Uh, any free upgrades, uh, new 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 versions, all that's available to you. And uh, since we've had lots of customers, uh, we got we got a huge customer base. So uh, that allows us to uh, to to give you free phone and email support as well. Okay, because usually you won't need it because these software uh, it's it's very easy to learn and it, it's it's very easy to use. It's no hassle software. But in case you need it, uh, let us know. There's a free email and free phone uh, support available to you. Okay, but yes, that uh, that comes with free upgrades as well for the year. All right, great. Thanks so much. Um, I don't see any other questions coming up on um, on the questions box. So um, people, if you need uh, uh, the presentation slides from Tim 
Hey, please send an email to Tim. Tim's email is right there on your screens. Tim at timwalker.com. That's his email that you see on the screen. Please do send an email to Tim, and he'll be happy to send those uh, presentation slides to you. And uh, we've also been recording this entire uh, session, webinar session, and it'll be up on eGrabber's website as well. So if you'd want to take a look at it, um, just give us some time to upload that on eGrabber's website. And you could go to eGrabber.com forward slash webinar and take a look at the webinar archive that's been uploaded there as well. All right, um, that's all time that we have today on the webinar. Tim Clinton, thank you so much for taking the time and doing this today. Uh, it's really useful information. I'm sure we're going to hear from a lot of people today. Thanks again. Cheers, Thanks, folks. Guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.